attendees are trickling in. Hi everyone that has joined. Um, we will be starting in about a minute or two. Um, we're going to wait for some more people to log in and then we'll get started. Cheyenne, are we doing the Q&A at the end for both of us? Is that how it's going to work? Yep. Okay. We'll give it one more minute and then we'll get started. Just remember to cut me off if I keep rambling. Yeah, we'll edit that out before the recording. Okay, well, I guess we'll get started. Um, I want to thank everyone um, for attending our Argonne Medical ACES webinar. Um, tonight we have Dr. Neil Karana and Dr. Neil Cohn speaking on rotational thrombectomy. If you have any questions throughout the event, uh, feel free to put them in the chat box or the Q&A uh, box and then it will be uh, monitored and answered at the end of the presentation. Um, without any further ado, um, we can get started with Dr. Karana. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I know everybody's time is precious in the midst of a busy day and busy practice, but wherever you, wherever you are in the world, uh, I hope that uh, everything is safe and well. And uh, I'm actually really excited to talk about uh, Cleaner and how I use it in my practice. And I think this is gonna be a robust discussion on not only uh, how to be creative with it, but uh, there's no right way to use these devices. It's gonna be tailored to each patient, each case and each, each physician. Uh, I'm an interventional radiologist and I practice uh, in a three state region in, in the US um, on the border of South Dakota, Iowa, and Nebraska. And my partner is a vascular surgeon, which uh, makes it pretty interesting when you know we collaborate uh, and you get to share ideas with people from other fields. So whether you're a vascular surgeon or a cardiologist, interventional nephrologist, uh, or a radiologist, um, I hope that you learn something from uh, what I have to share, which is going to be a lot of cases. Okay, let me go back there. So as you know, the cleaner is a um, thrombectomy device that's rotational. And this sinusoidal wire right around here is what does all the cleaning action. It actually is able to oppose itself to the vein wall and clear adherent clot, uh, making it more effective than other rotational devices. It uh, expands to about uh, nine millimeters. I'm gonna to try to go back there. For some reason, I can't go back there. Can you go back one slide? Thank you. Um, so nine millimeters is what the six French device is. There's also a seven French flavor of it that will allow that sinusoidal wire to approach 15 millimeters. Um, there's an infusion port that allows TPA or other uh, fluids or contrast to be delivered uh, through the side hole uh, at the end right here. Uh, you open the box up, you put it in, it has an atraumatic tip so you don't have to worry about poking anything. It's not over the wire uh, and it's single use. So you press a button and you go with it. 
Um, it's uh, indicated for AV fistula as our grafts, and it also is indicated for DVT. And some of you might be wondering in what applications you would use this for. Uh, and I have a couple DVT cases to show. We did talk about the variation in sizes, uh, seven French or six French. Uh, there is a significant difference in how robust that seven French device is. Um, I have never used it in a AV graph or fistula. It's, it's a little too large for, for native veins, uh, in my opinion, but for DVT, uh, the seven French is where it's at. Uh, it does come in multiple lengths and it basically spins at 4,000 RPM. So we talked about these. I'm going to just blow through this so you guys can see the actual uh, cases. I think that's where the meat of this presentation is about. Uh, but there are a lot of features of, it, of this that make it uh, favorable because there's not a big setup. The techs like it, easy to open up, put it on the table and start using it right away. Uh, within opening the package, it could be in the vessel within a minute. Uh, so it does, it's quick and easy to use is basically the selling point of the device um, on paper. So I have four different uh, uh, fistula slash graft cases um, and two DVT cases to go through. And we'll start off with, you know, standard AVD clot. And uh, I hope I'm not insulting anybody's intelligence or practice here, but I think it's, it's it would be remiss to not present the way I do it. Um, there is no right way, and I think Dr. Cohn will attest to that, uh, you know, um, a lot of physicians will have different methods and uh, you see other, I actually learn a lot from hearing other, however, other physicians treat their declots, and I've come up with little tips and tricks along the way. I trained at a very heavy uh, dialysis population institution in Chicago at Rush, and, uh, you know, it wouldn't be... Uh, it wouldn't be an abnormal day to do two or three declots in a day. So uh, I got pretty good at them and really checking that outflow all the way centrally is the first thing I do, making sure we're not missing any central stenosis that would basically make us chase our tail. Uh, if you open up the circuit and you get flow and then it shuts right back down, uh, it's very well that you didn't check centrally or you're not checking the inflow appropriately and you end up chasing your tail and making that case a lot longer. So doing a nice uh, central venogram in the beginning and then I do a pullback technique from uh, the axilla all the way back to the arm to see a couple things. And I'll, I'll show you what that means in a second. Uh, during that kind of initial venogram, uh, fistulagram, that's where I'm going to kind of look for where's the stenosis? Are we, am I seeing a point where it goes from normal patent vein to, to where the clock started? Is, are there prior stents there? Um, what's the situation? And then, of course, macerating uh, with the cleaner device and with TPA and a technique that I like to call the massage, and especially in AV grafts is, you know, putting your hand on the patient, uh, getting off fluoro, letting that uh, maceration occur and from externally pressing down and, and really allowing that device to get a, opposed to the graft uh, material to scrape it completely clean. Um, I do run a Fogarty balloon uh, over a wire centrally to clear the whole circuit. I poke backwards and uh, get a catheter into the artery, do an angiogram. At that point, uh, there may be some flow reinstituted, some slow flow, but I do put the Fogarty in the artery and pull it through. Now, as far as some people might have some opinions on whether or not they would put the cleaner in the artery itself, uh, I never do. Um, you know, maybe just the tip of it uh, into the passing anastomosis. And then if you're going to do that technique, which I'll show you a case where I have performed that, it's uh, absolutely prudent to be moving, you know, backwards uh, away from that anastomosis when the device is activated and not be flushing very hard anything in. The last thing you want is to have anything go down the arm. Uh, so once you, I call that pulling the plug with the Fogarty, uh, you check your outflow and treat whatever you see there that's needed. So first case is an AV graph. Here's our central run, like I said, and this isn't exactly, this is a good reason, a good example of why you check that is because this person has been stented before. Um, a lot of times you get the patient from St. Elsewhere and you're, you're walking into a case where you have a, a full metal jacket or you have really complex central stents. Those need to be checked pretty, pretty closely to make sure you're not missing anything that would, uh, you know, prevent you from opening this up successfully. So at the axilla here, I didn't post any actual fluoroscopy uh, DSAs because I thought that they don't transmit well over uh, a webinar. So these are just basically some pictures here. Positioning my catheter, injecting and pulling back at the same time during a DSA run, 
will really allow to you know you to see where the normal vein is, where the clot starts, and then within the actual this is a stented outflow. You can see where the clot has kind of started to adhere and is the bulkiest parts. The reason I do this is I'm allowed to I'm allowing myself to focus on these regions when using the cleaner device. Uh, really putting my arm on those regions, allowing the device to macerate this clot into uh, with the TPA so that when it does go forward to the lungs, you're not sending huge chunks of clot to the lung. So right here is where the stents end. Past there was pretty much open vein, so I know that the clot is starting directly at where that stent is. And then right over here, there's a pretty big chunk of clot right there. And those are the areas I'm going to be focusing on. And in this patient, we went backwards and we got into the artery, uh, you know, we do have flow rest restored, but there is adherent clot right here. And this is a technique that I think is really important, um, is that if you're going to put the cleaner in retrograde towards the anastomosis, you can remove this sheet over a wire and you have to do a couple pulses because you don't want the cleaner to get too tight up into the wire that's there. But you can do a couple pulses and scrape that away and then reinsert your sheath back in um, and continue the case. I, I find that you can run the cleaner safely with the sheath in place and try to manipulate it so that it kind of gets to underneath here. Uh, but really, I find the easiest thing to do is to go ahead and remove the sheath, get the introduced to the sheath back on, run the cleaner for just a couple seconds and put the sheath back in. So once we kind of did that and uh, there's the entire outflow from start to finish, except, uh, you know, a keen eye will notice that right here, there is a filling defect. Now, this was something that I could say, you can say, what would you do here? Would you angioplasty this? Would you take a Fogarty and try to push it forward? Or would you run the cleaner there a few times and, and if it's really adherent? And in, in this case here, what I did is, you know, I use my Fogarty balloon as a, as a device, not only to clear, clear the path, but also to get me an idea of how adherent this is. So as this balloon kind of uh, went over that lesion right there, you can see a little defect here, uh, but it does end up clearing the whole thing out and I did not need to use the cleaner in it anymore. But if I had to, it takes no more than a second to put it back in and run it for a few more seconds. So this was a pretty straightforward uh, ABD clot. Moving on to the second case here. Similarly, we have a stented outflow of a, of a ABD clot. You have a flame-shaped almost uh, clot uh, burden at the end of that previously stented region. And uh, there's a better picture of it. And here's the cleaner in action. One thing that, that's nice about this, it's really easy to visualize the device under fluoroscopy. Um, it's, it's very radio uh, dense, so you can see it no problem. But I go ahead and I do massage this graft externally while applying TPA uh, to make sure that we get a nice a slurry of clot before pushing it forward. And uh, here's the, my Fogarty pushing it forward. As it's going forward, I'm also looking for the Fogarty balloon to deform in certain ways that would give me an idea that there's some residual clot there. I'm also using tactile feedback to feel where I'm getting the most resistance as I'm pushing it through. And uh, this was a surprise. So this is not a straightforward AV graph. This is a patient who had a brachial basilic fistula that was converted to a AV graft and where the surgeon had tied in the AV graft was to the basilic remnant right here. So what we have is we have almost native fistula and then we have graft material moving forward. And this area here was quite aneurysmal. It had a lot of clot in it. I was a little bit worried that cleaning all of that out would have um, basically either putting the cleaner in would have pushed the clot uh, into the artery or it would re-clot what I just ended up cleaning. So what I ended up doing for this case is I first angioplasty the uh, anastomosis and that entire aneurysmal segment of that basilic vein just to allow a, a path to form and to allow flow to go integrate. Once I restored that flow uh, you know, towards centrally and flow was pretty good, I was able to put the cleaner in retrograde and really macerate that basilic outflow, uh, make sure crush everything up and flow was restored. So if we evaluate this uh, fistulagram now, we have a brachial basilic remnant and then we have a graft tied in and it's clean as a whistle. Right over here, it looks like there's some residual possibly stenosis at the end of that graft and then we have a big valve. There's maybe some clot in the valve there so that was angioplasty aggressively. And afterwards, the final remnant here, you can see you know, this, this 
someone can argue to go ahead and put a flared stent here across this valve to prevent further clotting. But in my case, I, uh, I, I just left it alone and she did fine. I did a three month fistulogram and everything looked great afterwards. Third case here is another graft uh, and this is a loop graft. So really the important part of this is, you know, loop graft goes from 47 millimeters and uh, it's, it's okay to put the device into that four millimeter segment of PTFE right here, put the tip in the artery and pull it back, allowing it to clear this part. And these are difficult because, you know, you can't have your initial access be all the way up here. Uh, you have to kind of manipulate the access point so where it's comfortable to work uh, on the table and over the patient, but the device is very flexible and can go retrograde here without a problem. Uh, that was an easy one to clear open and uh, everything was fine. I do point out that stuff like this does matter. Don't leave these things behind. All this needs to do is to flick off down the road and get caught at this little kind of pseudo stenosis here and you're gonna re-clot. Take the cleaner, take your time, macerate that, massage it, get that really crystal clear. That's exactly what I did here. You want a nice clean graph and a nice final picture. Fourth case for dialysis is gonna be a 80 people at the wrist. The reason I chose this case out of the many, you know, hundreds of B clots I've done was to just exemplify the device at the wrist level in smaller vessels and how it performs uh, and how it also performs in native native vasculature rather than PTFE. Uh, it's, it's really safe. It's an atraumatic device in my opinion. Here's a basilic outflow. I did my pullback. I found exactly where that stopped right there. That's where I knew I had a declot from. Uh, I went ahead and went retrograde and opened things up. And as I opened things up right here, I noticed though the reason was the inflow was poor. I was able to go ahead and plasty that, get your inflow restored, and here's the outflow. And could I leave it like this? Well, they're accessing the patient at the wrist, so of course I could, but there is a cephalic outflow here that has clot in it, and I'm not gonna leave the patient half treated. Uh, as you know, these dialysis patients, the veins are their, their last hope, so if I can get this back open and in the future she needs a brachiocephalic, uh, they, they can use that, of course. So, you know, the, the, the device is able to, once I recannulated that, uh, I'm able to clean it out. There was some residual, pretty chronic stuff right here in the middle. Uh, here's a blown up picture of there. It's very fibrous, very stringy, and uh, cannot leave it like that. I ran the cleaner there just for about 20 seconds, gave it a little massage from the outside. And you can see there's a little vasospasm along that segment there. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, having that good outflow above the elbow was crucial to keep the, the wrist um, fistula open. We're gonna move into the DVT space. As many of you know, especially in times of COVID, we've been slammed with uh, hypercoagulable folks and a lot of DVT PE. Um, you know, this is a classic just case of uh, uh, ileal femoral with mainly femoral clot, which, you know, I'm pretty aggressive about if a patient's exhibiting, you know, phlegmasia, or of course, you know, if they have just massive swelling and their, their anticoagulation is just not gonna cut it. This was actually more chronic than it appears. This was um, a really chronic clot. I think this patient has had, you can see with the filter there, they've had a history of DVT PE. Someone left the filter behind. And uh, what I used is the Inari uh, clot retriever, and that was able to pass through even with the filter in place. But afterwards, these are the afterwards pictures. Uh, it doesn't look very good. There's a lot of gummy stuff here. No matter how many times you're gonna do that clot retriever, it's just not gonna be able to scrape that off the wall. Um, so this is what I'm left with, this really chunky, hard adherent clot. And that's where the cleaner comes into play. You know, you let the seven French device run through that region with some TPA, as long as it's not contraindicated. I'm not worried about this little bit macerated bits going up north. I mean, afterwards I did check at the filter level and everything was wide open but it really does a phenomenal job of cleaning out those valves and vessels. Moving on to my last case, I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Cohn after this one. This is probably one of uh, a more interesting case that leaves a lot of questions and options of how we approach these things in the future, what kind of devices we can use, how to get creative. Uh, this was a case of a filter that had a lot of clot in it. Now, some people would advise, well, remove the filter, well, then you're risking a massive amount of pulmonary embolism. Some people would advise maybe doing an angiovac and getting an M block, but as you know, that takes uh, a massive setup with uh, uh, venous venous extracorporeal circ circulation. So in my case here, I said, could I lyse it? 
Um, I don't know if lysis would really be the best bet because any chunks of clot are just going to be not that our lice are going to stay there. I'm going to have to go at it again anyways. I want uh, a quick case. I want less exposure of TPA to the patient and uh, I want the patient in and out as fast as possible. This was an inpatient though. So once I got through everything here, I again employed our, our friend, the, the clot retriever. And here you can see the basket right in the filter. Um, you know, obviously I saw the, the representative from the company turning his head the other way because, you know, this is something that you possibly can get caught up on the filter. Uh, this was an option filter and it was just fine. I was able to clear out a fair bit of clot from the leg, but look what's left here under the filter. I mean, that's a, that's a nasty amount of clot. And I don't have the pictures because in the midst of all of this, you're never thinking that you're going to show these in a presentation. But what I did is I actually put the Adari device from the contralateral groin above the filter. I opened it up. I think that opens up to about 16 millimeters, which of course it's not covering the entire IVC. But I know that when I put a cleaner around this area and I inject TPA while I'm macerating, it's going to break these bits up pretty small. And some of it was going to go into the uh, clot retriever device uh, that was superior to the filter. And some of it is going to get showered to the lungs, but the patient was fully anticoagulated and they didn't have any PP right there. Uh, so this was afterwards. This is after running the cleaner through this region above it. Uh, I did remove the clot retriever and found a considerable amount of really chronic thrombus in it. Uh, and the patient did absolutely great. So just to close up, I think, uh, you know, I'll, we'll save the questions after Dr. Cohn's uh, presentation, but uh, it's, it's a great device that has a lot of applications if used properly. And I think that uh, when it comes to dialysis, it's leave no clot left behind, make sure you have a clear circuit. And when it comes to DVTPE, uh, of course, debulking is going to be the best thing to do for the patient first. And then, uh, you know, anything that the cleaner needs to, to clean up at the end is really important uh, for a good outcome. So that's my 20 minutes. I appreciate all of your time and I'm looking forward to questions after the uh, presentation by Dr. Cohen. Okay. All right, so let me come back. So I wanna um, just um, to introduce myself. I'm actually in, uh, in a big healthcare system, uh, six hospital healthcare system in South Florida. It's a Broward County healthcare system and we, uh, serve as a huge encashment area here in Broward County, and um, and we are teaching facility and everything else. And I just want to we we get tons and tons of these type of cases, a lot of a lot of thrombectomies. Uh, we get a lot of grafts too, and um, a lot of declots, and, and uh, but, but we get a lot of DVTs and stuff. And I want to give you a little bit of um, a show of, uh, and I've been doing DVTs these kind of cases for many years, and I uh, want to I picked out some cases that I thought were. Were really good to do with the cleaner and, and uh, um, so I want to basically review mainly just DVTs in this in this presentation. So DVTs obviously is a big problem in the U.S. Um, 900,000 people per year um, and approximately a third of those develop PEs which is can be devastating because 10 to 30 percent of those will die in one month. 50% um, have long-term complications of post-thrombotic syndrome which I'll get to in a second. 33 actually will have recurrence within 10 year period. And actually we know that five to 8% of US population has a genetic defect um, that can cause increased, um, you know, increased thrombosis. Uh, so this is what post-thrombotic syndrome can look like. It's, it uh, could be devastating a lot. A lot of times you have swelling, pain, varicosities, hyperpigmentation, ulcers, pruritus, all this stuff. So, so this is something that we're really trying our best not to get to and that's why this is this is one of the reasons why DVTs are treated. Um, so so when do we get these clots? Well, uh, you know we get them. We hope to get them acutely, which is less than 14 days. But we know that that's not always the case. Sometimes we get acute on chronic. Chronic is usually more than 28 days. Subacute is usually within that window between acute and chronic. And um, obviously, the, we try to get them in acute phase because that's when we can do the best. Uh, we can do the best results. But obviously, since we don't get them only in the acute phase, we sometimes have to deal with the more chronic and subacute components as well. These are the different thrombolytic therapy options that are used today in our field. Um, I mean, anything from, and this is probably not used very much, inflow IVs, where people start IVs and just put um, TPA to IVs. Um, it's kind of you know 
was used at one time, but now mainly we do other things. Uh, infusion catheters are still used somewhat when you put a, a, a side hole catheter in the clot and let, let it bathe in this thrombolytic, so whether it's TPA or TNK, and let it infuse uh, slowly overnight or, or for a amount of time. Um, other ones is ultrasound assisted is like an ECOS device where, where we're still infusing thrombolytics, but we're using ultrasound to help uh, get into the clot and break up the clot as well. Um, so that's ultrasound assisted infusions. Um, typically where the world is moving now and where, where most people are moving now is mechanical or pharmacomechanical assisted. Um, and that's basically using either mechanical alone or pharmacomechanical, which is a combination of mechanical device like a cleaner and using pharmacology like TPA with the uh, mechanical devices. And then also PTA and stenting are not uncommon to restore some of the reference vessel diameters that's done after uh, things are usually uh, cleaned out. Just, I'm gonna basically go over more of the pharmacomechanical type of, of treatments, but, um, and, the, and the reason why these are so important, uh, pharmacomechanical typically does aspirations, fragments, macerates, it dis disrupts the clot, um, and, and, and it can a lot of times pull the clot out so you don't get DBT, you I mean, don't get PEs. Um, so, so there have been randomized trials that have actually compared catheter-directed to pharmacomechanical directed. And a lot of the studies have shown that by using the pharmacomechanical, by, by fragmenting it and not just using a catheter directed, we get, we get a major reduction about a, up to 50% of hospital resources, infusion times of lytics, the total dose of thrombolytic drugs, the number of catheterizations we have to do, the fluoro time, and the major bleeding complications. So all these we are reduced when we, we, we add some type of mechanical um, component other than just using a catheter directed uh, component. And actually sometimes we don't use a catheter, we don't use any, any um, um, thrombolytics at all. We just use mechanical alone, especially for where it's contraindicated in, in, in patients. So there were a lot of trials and I just, I wanted to go over in a lot of registries and these were just historically, um, the, the big ones were the Pearl, which was a 329 mechanical registry that showed mechanical and, and thrombolytics. It was, um, and then the Cave and T study was actually comparing catheter directed with, with just standard of care. And then the Venus registry, and this was 287 patients. And that showed, um, that showed 287 patients and, and follow them over time, uh, you know, cleaning them. And this is also catheter directed. And when you look at, you compared like the mechanical to the catheter directed, there was a difference. I mean, if you looked at mean times of drips, it was 17 versus, you know, 58 hours or 48 hours for catheter directed. You can see a very low time of using mechanical and um, thrombolytics. So you decrease the time of the actual infusion of thrombolytics. Also, there were a lot less major bleeds, five as opposed to 22 or 11. So, so you're gonna get less bleeds, you're gonna get less time with the thrombolytics and typically you get a better outcome. Here is the percentage of clot removed. Um, and it actually the Cayman T study uh, a few years ago just came out with their five-year data that actually showed a, a absolute relative risk of 28% decrease in post-thrombotic syndrome. Um, in these patients. So there was a decrease in post thrombotic syndrome patients that had their clot removed. Um, then they came out, there was the ACTRACT trial, which I'm just going to briefly just say, basically it was a 629 patient trial of 24 months. And they looked at 24 months, showed really no, and this was basically the standard of care, which is anticoagulations and stockings versus the pharmacomechanical type of, of, of thrombus removal, like with TPA. And at 24 months, really didn't show any um, difference in post-thrombotic rates or post-thrombotic syndrome rates, but it did show that 25% um, of fewer, 25% and fewer patients experienced moderate to severe post-thrombotic syndrome. And especially for patients with iliofemoral DVTs, there was a lower risk of moderate to severe PTS. So, and that's 18% versus 28%. So we only treat the ones that have iliofemoral. We don't typically treat the FEMPOP ones because if they don't have a iliofemoral component because there was little difference shown in, the, in severity between these when you used, when you, resected, when you took out the clot versus the iliofemoral one. So the iliofemoral ones gave us the best benefit. Also the leg pain and swelling was significantly improved over 10 and 30 days which was important because these patients a lot of times have a lot of swelling and they also have a lot of pain. So this did decrease that over the, the first 10 and 30 days. And, and, and also 
Although major bleeds were a little bit increased. It was 1.7% versus 0.3% when they just got the standard of care. So we do get a little higher bleeding rate, but also we get, we get also some benefits as well. So when you clean these patients out, do we use uh, do we use a filter first? And and there you know this is very debatable. Some people always use filters before they do a mechanical thrombectomy or or a pharmacomechanical thrombectomy. Some people don't. Um, this study here that I like is 141 patients and actually showed that placement of IVC filter led to an eightfold reduction in the development of symptomatic iatrogenic PE. So it was. Uh, useful to put a, a, a retrievable filter prior to doing a DVT um, thrombectomy. And so this, this paper actually did advocate for putting um, a, a filter in prior to a pharmacomechanical thrombolysis due to the risk of breakaway PEs. So these are some of the different instruments and some of the different um, thrombectomy devices out there. And uh, you can see here, um, there's a lot of them. And I actually made like a little score card showing the different things that we look for. Do we store the pain, see, reduce symptoms, minimize trauma, and the cost effectiveness. And, and you can see a lot of these do restore pain, see. Um, unfortunately, the, the oral anticoagulation do, doesn't do much. It takes time for it to restore pain, see, but, you know, the rest of them do. Um, teratola is typically not used in the, the venous system alone. Um, typically, it's used more in grafts and stuff. Um, so they all somewhat reduce symptoms. Um, so that's one good thing. Um, the minimized trauma. So trauma is a big one. Um, one of the nice things about cleaner, it does not cause a lot of trauma to the vessel, um, as opposed to androjet, which does have some hemolysis risk. Um, the androvax is probably the worst because it has a huge, you know, sheath, 22 French. Um, these are a little bigger, clot treatment is 13 French. And then, you know, some of the other ones. So the, the main thing that the cleaner really stars at, though, is the price. If you look at cost effectiveness, a lot of these have a capital um, uh Thing that you have to buy a capital startup cost, whereas the cleaner really doesn't. It's a it's a disposal device, and it's probably out of these. It's one of the cheapest ones when you're talking about cost effectiveness. So it does everything that these do somewhat, but with a really cost effective way. So now we looked at the cleaner device, and, and um, Dr. Kurana did a really good job with this. So I'm not going to spend much time, but but some of the pros and cons. Economical, we talked about no capital purchase, pre-assembled. It's wall contacting, and as Dr. Karana said, it has a nine to 15 millimeter um, uh, wall contact, depending on which size you use. Um, the, the other thing, it creates a large channel because it does contact the wall. Um, and it's um, a single wire. Now the, the wire is an A035 wire if you use the smaller version, the nine millimeter, but if you go to a 15 millimeter, it goes to a 0044. So it's a thicker, robust, more robust wire for the for the, the bigger system. And then there's multiple, like, like Dr. Grana said, is six and seven French sizes, 65 and 135 centimeter length. Now, what are some of the cons? Well, um, it may require an IVC filter, which I typically do like to put a filter in when I use the cleaner, just because if there are some clots that get away, it will, it will, it will catch them. Um, it's not over the wire, which sometimes is nice to have, especially in torturous vessels. Um, often used with thrombolytics as opposed to alone. Sometimes we use them with thrombolytics, not always, but a lot of times we'll, we'll combine this with other products. And I think this is where the cleaner really stars is that you can really combine them with almost anything. It's a cheap way to have another thing on board. And can, if you have some residual clot using um, a clot tree or anything else, you can basically open one of these for a few hundred dollars and, and, and easily get these clots away. Um, it's typically combined synergistically with other devices. So some of the cases I have, um, this is how we do our DBTs. We basically uh, get the patient to, to lay prone. And um, basically we, we enter usually with a popliteal vein, but you can go through the jugular or you can go, uh, you know, uh, from the contralateral iliac and go above and over. Um, but typically we like the popliteal axis site. Uh, we typically sometimes put a retrieval filter most of the time and we do a mechanical thrombolytics, a mechanical thrombectomy, sometimes plus or minus lytics. Um, we do use a lot of angioplasty, and we and we do stent a lot in the iliacs, especially if there's anything that we think that is abnormal. Um, we do use some um, concomitant heparin, and we do, we, do, we do leave these patients for six months on anticoagulation afterwards. So this is uh, one of our cases. Um, this is a 62-year-old man with a three-day history, left lower extremity swelling. You can see here a complete thrombosis of the whole leg up, up to the iliac, uh, iliac veins. And um, so the first thing we did here, we image it. You can see it's completely thrombosed. Um, we have our wire through it. We use a um, 100 centimeter, um, this is an option. Actually, it's, a, it's an option IVC filter and it comes to a 100 centimeter axis 
that's also by Argon. It, you can actually deploy it through the palpatil vein. So we actually, this way we don't have to access it to anything else. We make a little access site at the palpatil vein. We, we put our sheath up and we deploy the filter through the option, uh, through the, the option filter through the uh, 100 centimeter sheath. And then we will go ahead and use uh, the filter on this uh, device. And you can see this is after one pass, there's still some residual clot um, in this. And then we basically, um, we'll go ahead and we actually put a few hours of lytics in this and then we bought them back and did another pass of the, um, of the cleaner. And we can see here basically um, using those two passes plus a little lytics, basically we, we got a pretty much complete response and widely patent uh, vein. So that it was actually a really nice, nice outcome just using the cleaner and a little bit of lytics. <clears throat> This is another patient who is this 58 year old man with recurrent DVTs and again palpiteal vein access you can see here it looks pretty clean down low but as we get higher we see this bunch of clots in there. So we use uh, you know typically we use an angiojet first and you can see here the angiojet caused a um, cause it causes a channel but there's still a lot of residual clot there. Um, so we're putting the cleaner in there as you can see there you can see how nicely opacified you can see the cleaner and that's past post cleaner you can see, um, pretty, pretty good, pretty good uh, opening, and, and you can see kind of cleaned out. And this patient actually got a stent here uh, because there was some underlying abnormality. But, but, and you can see here the filter uh, in place. So this is a patient who um, it's a it's a young guy who had swelling times one week of his leg, and you can see here that we look for respiratory variations when we do our, our DVT ultrasounds. Here you can see this is normal. You should always see this in a right common or in a common femoral vein. When this one was flat, so you know when this thing is not very when there's no variation in the common femoral vein, you know there's more proximal um, either thrombosis or narrowing or something. So when we looked at it, on you can see here this clot going right up in the, in the iliac vein and, and and a lot of a lot of probably some of it was subacute some of it was more chronic but so as we went on um, we basically did use the cleaner and uh, we went actually up this 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 site straight um, retrograde and and we actually did uh, clean it out using the cleaner and stented it now this basically was caused by uh, May Turner syndrome, which is a very common uh, or one of the more common types of, of reasons for having uh, DVTs. And uh, it's important that you understand it's caused by uh, the left lower extremity being compressed by the right common iliac artery, as you can see. And you have to treat it. If you're going to treat it um, with endovascular, you have to put a stent in there. Otherwise, uh, it basically will come back or won't, you can't just balloon it. It won't work. So you have to stent it to keep it open. Um, conservative management really does not work. Another just couple quick cases. This is another patient again has extensive DVT. You can see how the DVT is pretty extensive, probably is subacute and chronic as well. Um, you can see here going through it. Now this is this is with the first pass through the, the cleaner. You can see there's still a lot of residual clot. Then we did another pass and you can see which every pass Every pass you do, you basically get a little better uh, opening. And the way we do our passes, we do start distally and come back proximally. So we basically run it. And as we come back, we basically, and we can do that multiple times. Sometimes if there's an area that we know is uh, a lot of clot, we'll stay there for a while and just work it a little bit more longer, you know, to just keep it going at that area. And, and then we image it to make sure that that clot is gone or macerated. And then we typically will angioplasty it as well. Couple more quick cases. Again, this is IVC clot, and you can see here angiojet basically made a small channel, but didn't really clear it. And this is post, you know, uh, using um, 24 hours after the, we did lytics and the cleaner and everything else, basically with a what balloon did, and we got a really good result uh, post. <clears throat> this is just another case where it was more chronic, and you can see prior to doing that and post. And this one we used a, a combination of angioj cleaner, T and K, wall and a wall stent. But we got a really good result, and the thing was wide open. The other thing I just want to talk briefly about is upper extremity, just for five, five minutes. Basically, uh, two to four percent of these are upper extremity uh, DVTs. The axillary and subclavian veins are not uncommon. We get swelling and discoloration. Typically, they'll cause either effort thrombosis, 25%, or secondary due to uh, catheter-related. Um, picks do a lot of this damage, too. Here we can see a patient. You can see how there's all these collaterals and everything. So we went from below. Again, you can see the tunnel catheter in there. That's causing it, probably one of the causes. So we did the balloon angioplasty. You can see here uh, we ballooned it extensively. Um, 
again, ballooned it. We went from upstairs to downstairs uh, ballooning, and we basically got that post ballooning. And then we decided to go ahead, uh, other than ballooning, we also used, uh, this is post ballooning. We got a pretty good result, but there's still a lot of clot left and we cleaned everything out with the cleaner. And you can see here, this is post cleaner. You can see it pretty much cleaned it all up and it looks really nice. I mean, and we took the tunnel catheter out obviously because that's what caused it. But but you can see the cleaner works really well after after there's some debris left to just to, to finish it off. Um, again, the same kind of thing here. Again, catheter related clot. You can see all this clot around the catheter. Take the catheter out, go ahead and put the cleaner in and you can see put the, and then put the, the actual catheter back. And you can see here it's all cleaned out and you can see the catheter is back in place. And this is our final upper extremity one. You can see here, this is all out, all, all thrombosed and mostly, most a lot of it's chronic subacute kind of thing. So we got through it, we put heavily angioplasty, it, we did the cleaner as well and stented it. And that's what we got as a result. So we're able to clean out a lot of these by, you know, using aggressive angioplasty, some of the cleaner, some, you know, and then stenting. And finally, I want to show you something that's really interesting. So thrombus around the catheter, this is what I really want to show, fibrin sheaths. We use this a lot for fibrin sheaths. The patients come back when they have a tunnel catheter and the catheters don't work and almost always they have a fibrin sheath associated with them. But typically what we'll do first, we'll put 11 French, we'll take this out, we'll put an 11 French sheath in, we'll put a wire in and then we'll balloon it aggressively. And then, unfortunately the balloons don't work very often. This is, um, you can see here, this is a patient who we ballooned. And then we, we shot it afterwards. You can see it's like a tubular, whoops, it's like a tubular thing. It, it doesn't really, this should be all vessel and it's a, a probably a sheet that's actually causing it not to disperse the contrast. So after putting the cleaner in there, which we do, we, we get a really nice, you can see how open it is here. This is how pre, you can see it just does not, you can see it's not normal. If we put the tunnel catheter back in there, it's not gonna work normally, even after balloon it, ballooning it. And um, after we put the cleaner in there, it actually worked really well. And you can see how nice and open it gets. I just wanna show you the same thing again with other cases where we use that. So here's another one, again, non-functioning tunnel catheter. Um, we go in there and we take the tunnel catheter out, put a sheath in. No, Let's see. Okay, so that's actually one of my, I don't know, that one's blank. I don't know, I guess that was, wasn't put in, but it, that, that one looks blank. Let me show you one last case with that. So this is it again. So here again, this is the sheath. You can see here that it's all, this is the catheter. And you can see this is all sheath that's holding it and the contrast is not flowing smoothly. And it was actually, um, we basically ballooned it. It didn't really work much. That's post ballooning again. You can see it's still, the sheath is still there. And then after doing the, here's my cleaner device there. We put that in and then you can see post, um, it's coming back, but you can see it night widely opens up and you can see actually good flow. So, so this works really well um, to do that. If you have a sheath here again, a fibrin sheath, you can, here you can put the cleaner in right over in the fibrin sheath and uh, post fibrin sheath. Look, it's all gone widely open. And then we put our catheter back in there. Um, and that's basically a little bit of some of the stuff we do with DBTs and our, uh, and our catheters and, and in some ways that we clean out uh, our DBTs and our clots. Um, if there's any questions, I'm sure um, we'd be happy to take them at this point, um, myself and Dr. Karuna. Yes, we do have some questions that we have um, in the question box. One, someone's asked, have you ever pulled the plug with the cleaner or do you use the Fogarty? Uh, that's a great question. And I always pull the Fogarty first and if I feel like that's not doing the job because of very adherent chronic clot just uh, after the anastomosis in the juxtanastomotic area, I will position the cleaner uh, just so that the tip is, just the tip is in the artery. And that first sinusoidal wave, I mean, you can advance it a little bit further. It's atraumatic, it's not gonna hurt the artery, but uh, you know, the key point there is when you turn that on, you have to be pulling it back as soon as that first rotation starts. The last thing you want to do is any forward pressure that would push any clot back into the artery. So uh, it is safe to put in the artery from my experience anecdotally. And as long as you have, uh, and I would not recommend flushing in that direction, uh, whether it's from the sheath or from the device itself, I would only use it just for the mechanical portion and allowing it to pull back. But uh, in short, yes, uh, using it at the anastomosis only after a Fogarty fails. 
Yeah, so my, my experience with it, I, I just want to give it, my experience with it, so we use it tons and tons for, I use it for every one of my fistulas as well and my declots. So we typically, the way I, I usually do it is I, um, I typically will do, do the whole graft or a fistula with the cleaner first. And then typically, um, just like Dr. Corona does, I clean everything out with the balloon. I use a, I use a Fogarty to clean everything out. Then I pull the plug at the end. Usually I pull it with a Fogarty, but I can tell you that um, after I pull the plug at the end, 90% of the time, my fistula is pretty good. It's done. I mean, my whole usually takes me 15, 20 minutes to do a fistula a declot, you know, with a graft, especially 15 minutes. And it's all done because the, by the time I pull the plug, my fistula is real clean. And typically, you know, I'll do, I do a very, you know, I'll, I'll make sure the cleaner does it, all the work for me. And then at the end, I pull the plug with the actual, uh, Fogarty. So I do use a Fogarty, but, um, but it, it makes it really quick with the, with the cleaner device. Great, thank you. Um, we have a few other questions. Um, what do you choose when you use cleaner, um, like for resilient clot, or do you use it for every fistula, um, and why? And does your algorithm change um, with OBL versus hospital? It looks like Dr. Cohen already said that he uses it for all of his uh, declots, and I would uh, say I agree, and I do too. Um, the only times I would probably not use it is if we have a very tortuous native fistula. At that point, I've employed over-the-wire triatolas just because I know I'm not going to be able to na navigate the device uh, safely through a tortuous, uh, uh, you know, native vein. Um, but for most cases, uh, I think it's a good thing. It's pretty much open on the table as long as we know that the thing is clotted uh, before we get started. And then the question about the OBL in the hospital. Uh, thrombectomy does not reimburse uh, in the OBL setting, so it's not cost effective to do it there. Um, in the ASC, I wouldn't really know uh, under that kind of um, structure if, if it would be feasible to do that from a financial standpoint, but uh, it's, it's pretty much relegated. I do keep one at the OBL though. And the reason why is that I do a lot of basic fistulograms there and you never know what you're going to run into uh, or what happens during the case that would, uh, if you end up having a completely clotted access, uh, I think they're, they're, they're cost effective enough to keep one on hand in situations for a DVT, let's say, or some venous case that you're doing that uh, uh, you would need to macerate. I, I think that that's important to have that as a backup. Um, we had one question that said, approximately what percentage of your cases is acute? We're talking obviously about DVTs, I, I imagine. So, because um, we only, with the grass, we're probably in fistulas are all acute. So, so with, with the D DVTs, um, so they're, they're mostly acute. I mean, we typically will get patients that come in with acute leg pain within a day or two or three days, leg pain, leg swelling. One of the problems is, though, sometimes they, they're recurrent. So, so although they have an acute component, they have a chronic component or a subacute component as well, because, um, you know, the, maybe the, the chronic one was never fully treated or, or is still there and then it, and then you get an acute component on top of it so so I think that we you know we will get a lot of acute ones but some of them are have some subacute or a chronic component with the acute on there so I, I would say probably I would say probably 70 percent to 80 percent are probably acute and then we do get some real chronic ones as well too that that we can't get through when they're very chronic and they're old you know the the clot becomes extremely rubbery and it's almost impossible sometimes to even get through especially if they're you're talking months. Um, but not, luckily, those are usually rare just because uh, patients usually come to the hospital or, or come because they have acute symptoms. Um, the ones that are harder, though, are the ones that have acute on chronic that have a component of chronic and acute. And those are those are the ones that, you know, you can get through and try to clear. And, and the cleaner, actually, there, there's some things that, are, that do pretty well um, with those, some of the thrombectomy devices we have. And, and the cleaner is one of them that, that can, uh, because of the wall up position, that's pretty well with, with some of those. I, I don't know, what do you think, Dr. Corona? Yeah, I, I, agree. I think, um, you know, for the most part, um, you know, in the acute setting, we've really worked with the ED physicians and the hospitalist physicians and the inpatient side to kind of know when to consult us. And it's pretty much, you know, consult us anytime you have a DVT, uh, you know, checking that 
iliac extension is, is sometimes missed on the initial ultrasound. So doing a CT venogram or a traditional venogram or having an ultrasound tech go back and look. But, you know, we're really seeing these more in the acute subacute setting. Um, if they walk in from an outpatient setting, it's usually subacute at that point, uh, you know, just a couple of weeks. Uh, the chronic stuff, those are always, you know, here and there and you see them in waves for some reason. I always see like I have a clinic day where I have just, you know, two really chronic DVTs. Uh, and then you don't see one for a couple months, but those are challenging cases and they're also extremely rewarding. And uh, when they do, uh, uh, we successfully thrombectomize those and get flow restored. And I think, uh, you know, having all these tools and all these techniques are important to run a, a successful uh, DVT practice uh, from head to toe. Great. One just came in. Uh, what key factors do you use to differentiate between which PMT device you choose for the case? Do you want to take that first or? Yeah, I think we agree based on this, but I think it's still a good question. Uh, you know, in the in the dialysis setting, I think we've, we've uh, exhausted uh, kind of our algorithms there. And, uh, but in the DVT setting, again, it's the chronicity, I think makes a big deal and uh, how we first approach it. I, I'm still a fan of lysis. I think it's a, a phenomenal uh, technique for very acute uh, stuff. I think even in the subacute setting, you know, clearing out uh, some of that acute, more acute clot out of the way before getting started. But just with the advent of uh, quad retriever, you know, it's kind of in a very occlusive um, a DVT. It's the, my first go-to uh, before pulling out the cleaner. Um, I think that really adherent clot, as you've seen in some of the case examples, uh, needs to be uh, scraped off literally, and that's what the cleaner is there for. So I think uh, Dr. Cohen really hit it nail on the head with about being uh, synergistic with multiple devices. Yeah, so I, I agree, and and we we do use all the we have all the devices in in house as well. We have you know we have the the clot retriever, we have we have, we have the lightning, and and and. And we use them all, but it really depends. Um, some some are better than others. One of the nice things about the cleaner we use, uh, we, we don't think twice about taking the cleaner out. If we uh, if we have any residual clot, no matter what you use, um, the, the 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 easiest thing is very like for instance, the, you can't take you can't use the clean you can't use a clot retriever and then decide well there's some residual clot let's take the lightning and you know tool, let's take the lightning device out because now you're spending ten thousand fifteen thousand dollars. So you really, you really are, you know, you, you, it, it, whereas the cleaner, you know, if you take, you do the clot retriever and, and you're going to take a, and there's some residual clot there and, you know, you're going to spend a few hundred dollars more to use the cleaner device. Um, it's actually worth it. And we do that a lot. So we use the cleaner many times to clean up all different, different uh, things when we use, no matter what we use. And it's also very good if we do lytics first or lytics uh, before lytics to break up the clot and do lytics afterwards, you get, um, you really break up the clot well and, you, and it allows the lytics to work a lot better uh, if you're gonna use lytics. And a lot of times you, your lytics are very, if you're gonna run lytics, they, they still work really well, but you're gonna decrease the, the time significantly by running the cleaner through first. Um, if you use other devices, obviously, um, and there's residual clot, you can also take out the cleaner and, and do that as well. Um, but but it's just a good overall type of um, uh, system that allows you to get wall contact and 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 open you know open the whether it's official or whether it's a um, you know a DVT it allows you to to open up really quickly um, and and you know easily so I think it's it's something that we do use synergistically a lot and um, and or even as a first line. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, looks like a lot of these questions we've already touched on. Um, we'll give it a 30 more seconds. If you have any other more any questions, please put them in the question and a answer box and um, we can finish. I, I do see a questionnaire from an anonymous attendee that says, do you use IVC filtration for iliofemoral or cable thrombectomy? Um, that is, you know, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I don't think there's a right answer to it. Um, I have before in the past, I don't do for every case. It really depends on the monoclot burden. What's the patient's pulmonary respiratory, uh, cardio, cardiopulmonary status? Uh, do they have history of PE? Do they have a history of chronic pulmonary hypertension? Do they have already some PE sitting there? You don't want to add on to that burden, uh, but you know, you know, I think it's a, it's not an every time thing. It's really case dependent. And the one case I showed where I left the clot retriever basket open contralaterally above that filter, and I felt safe, you know, macerating and sending stuff up into there. 
was a good i uh, a good idea um again i don't think there's a, a right answer for that but it, it you know it's definitely a useful technique if needed yeah, I, I agree. And, and, and it, you know, there are a lot of studies out there. Some of them show yes, some of them show no. Um, there's still a really a good debate going on as opposed to does everybody use a no. Um, there, are, there have been, though, uh, people who haven't used it that have had PEs that were um, significant. So, so you can get a significant PE by not using it sometimes. Um, it, it does work well with the cleaner because the cleaner is very fast and it, and, it, and it does really well, but sometimes you can have some chunks that maybe fly and, and it does catch those things. So I think it is a good idea if you're just going to use a cleaner by itself um, to put a, um, a filter in, a, a retrieval filter. Um, but again, it's very fast and it, and it cleans it out really well, but I think it's a good idea to put it as a protection device. Um, again, patients who are high risk. <clears throat> patients who have significant lung disease or uh, COPD or patients who've had previous PE or things like that, as Dr. Karana said, then those patients sh probably should be protected because they may not have a lot of reserve. So if you end up uh, getting another PE, they, you may push them over the edge. Um, but again, I, I think um, it's with the retrieval of filters we have now, they're very easy to take out. Um, there really is not that much downside. Very rarely do we ever not, are not able to take them out. So if there's any question at all, I think it's not a bad idea to put it in. Um, this is my opinion. And that's why I showed you uh, some of them that we did put filters in. Um, I have never, I've done hundreds and hundreds of, of DBTs and I've, I have not had a significant PE. I, I use it about, I, I use it about 60, 70% of the time, but I know my partner has had one that was very significant. A patient almost died from a PE doing, a, doing one of those. So I guess you can have some complications with them. So just something to think about. And then I see a question here that you have about um, uh, using uh, uh, this in a tips for you. I have not, uh, but I think that's a great idea. So whoever asked that question, I'm going to steal that from you. Yeah, no, and, and we actually have used it on a tips, um, a clotted tips. Um, so uh, it does work well on, on clotted tips. You just put it in there and, and, and just macerate the clot. It, it actually uh, worked really well for us. So we have done it before on a, on a clotted tips. Great. Um, we have a question about innovation. Where do you see it heading in the next three to five years within the space? Well, as you guys know, it's been a wild 18, 24 months in the space of DVTPE uh, with a couple of the devices that we've named tonight. Uh, and, you know, I think people are getting more comfortable going bigger. Uh, people are getting comfortable using less uh, lytic uh, and people are getting more comfortable, providers are getting more comfortable, um, you know, uh, uh, chasing DVT so that we see PTS uh, so much in our clinic on, on chronic patients. It's it's. I think we're just driven to, to go ahead and treat and come up with new things. So it, for innovation, I think that devices are going to be more um, focused on aspiration uh, instead of sending the clot. I think a lot of the questions people had today is, you know, whether you should use a filter, how much is going to go to the lungs, what is safe, what is not. So, you know, a combination of, of, of a macerated thrombectomy with aspiration, I think uh, there's going to be a lot, a lot to be had in that space uh, in the near future. Yeah, I agree. I think aspiration is the future. Um, you can see the way it's going. I mean, a lot there's mo most of the new devices now have some sort of aspiration on it. That obviously an aspiration device does protect um, the lungs a lot better. Um, does protect you from getting clots because you're basically instead of just macerating it, you're actually uh, removing it. Um, so I, I think that that does have some more protection. Um, and over time, you know, as these devices get better and you get better aspiration and stuff, you may you see filter use less and less. Um, but, uh, you know, again, there's always times, even in these, you know, when you use macerating devices and then you use uh, suction devices, there's always like some clot left that you can't get. And, and one of the nice things about the cleaner is you just pull this thing out and in five minutes you run it through and it's basically gone. So um, it is a really good adjunct to almost, you know, any, any device that you have when, you, when, when there's any residual clot there. <clears throat> Great. Well, um, I think we're all done with questions. Um, I would like to thank you both. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for the attendees that tune in today um, to view our ACES webinar. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate uh, the opportunity. And I hope you all do well uh, wherever you are.
Yeah, me too. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all your time. And I uh, hope we'll see you guys one day. Take care.